Lori Houston's News for the Heart is dedicated to helping you give a voice to your own soul. Our hearts have the power to free us from pain and the struggles that keep us from awakening to our true essence. Join Lori now as we delve into our heart and soul to find the path that will open us to the possibilities and lead us to the life we love to live. Good afternoon. This is News for the Heart. And today, well, it's always my favorite day when I have Tom Campbell on. And we're always excited about having Tom because we get to, uh, well, I get to, I get, I just get to chat, which is always fun for me. Oh, well, wait a minute. Do I get to chat? (laughs) (laughs) Every once in a while. Oh yeah. Every once in a while. (laughs) (laughs) You know, a lot of the comments seem to be talking about your experiment and where that's going and if that's going. And I know I don't want to get into it too much because I know that it is going because I know you're having meetings and stuff with people. So I know that that's still happening, but I know that there's a lot of people that seem to want to know, I guess, what's kind of going on with that. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. Sure. Sure. We can take five minutes or less to talk about that. Yes. The experiments are, are in you know are going on in the sense that we are continuing to uh, to to press getting those done and right now uh, the, it's looking very good we have a we actually have three players that might be doing the experiments which is okay. good because if we have enough money we can have them done multiple places which is even better science because that's what if you know given that they work they'll want repetition to see that they work at another place and so on so that's just the way science is done so we have uh the original place that we were working on they slowed down because the the physicist doing it got very very busy he started his own company and did a couple of other things that now have taken all of his time for the moment so he still wants to do them but they're kind of sliding off to the right time time wise well then we had another another group uh, this time out on the West Coast, and uh, they are real anxious to do them, and we'll probably start working on them this this summer, uh, <laughs> probably you know mid May, something like that. So that's only you know less than a month away. So hopefully, you know, when I say started on them, it doesn't mean they'll actually be finishing the experiments, and it means they will be getting the equipment and plugging it together, and you know getting it all to work. So they're going to start working on it, and I suspect that if things go well there we'll have them all done by the end of the summer because they'll have about three months over the summer to work with it Um, and that's plenty of time to do these experiments they're they're not all that hard if things don't go you know well or perfectly then maybe it'll take a few more months after that and besides that uh, there is a contact I have that's that knows some people in some of the uh, federal labs in the US who he thinks that he can talk into doing the experiments as well. And that's because they don't have enough budget to pay for everybody for the whole year. So what they do is they go out and have to find other research and other things to do on their own. So they're, they're kind of hungry for other things to do, you know, if, if those other things come with money, which ours will, since we had the kickstart. So, so we've got all those going on. So it looks like sometime this this uh, summer we'll start getting some results back. Nice. And the first experiment is particularly easy. So I expect that to be the first one done. And that could be as early as, you know, May, early June. So yes, we're working on it. Um, you know, we've had we've had a couple of, you know, starts and stops and things that look good and then didn't work out. And it's it's uh not a trivial thing to hire a you know a group of physicists at a university someplace to do your experiment. Mostly they're busy doing other things, and we're looking for particular kinds of people, you know, that that uh, not only have have the right experience but the right attitude. You know, they're willing just to see what happens. So that's good. So we're it's. It, Progress is being made, but it is grinding on slowly. See, this, um, I think we, we got that money actually under our control sometime in June or July. You know, the, the uh, Kickstarter ran through May, and then it takes a while before the money actually changes hands and gets collected. So maybe it was like sometime in July we got that. So we're getting close. You know, we're pressing on a year in the next couple of months. Mm. But hopefully by the time we get to July, we'll have some of them done. So we will have had them done within about a, in about a year. 
and uh, we I, we couldn't have done it much quicker than that. We're all volunteers, so we don't have anybody whose job is you know full time job is just to get these experiments done. So we're everybody's working on the the uh, rewards that we offered people for their donations and that it's all volunteer. So it gets done as people have time to do it, you know, and that makes it a little slower. And I think people have also been asking if they can still contribute. Is there any way to contribute still? Oh, yes. You can go to the uh, CUSAC, which is Center for the Unification of Science and Consciousness. That's a, a, a well, 501c3, which means the IRS has dubbed that as tax. Um, uh, you, know, you don't have to pay taxes on that on that money for the donations, at least if you're in the U.S. If you're not in the U.S., I don't know that it means anything at all. I guess it means you don't have to pay taxes in the U.S., but some other countries also have relationships with that. So the profitable organizations, you know, uh, not just within one country, but in multiple countries can can also, uh, you know, do their, their uh, uh, what do we call it, tax-exempt work and people can donate from around the world. So in some countries, probably Canada, I suspect that you're one that kind of agrees, you know, that has mutual arrangements with the U.S. for that sort of thing. So it may be tax deductible to you too. I don't know. You'd have to check that, but at least it is in the U.S. Well, I should say it, used to, it, it should be in the U.S. in about another month. Okay. We got about two months ago, we got a letter from the IRS that said, everything looks great. And we'll get to it in about 90 days. And that was about two months ago. So we've got like another 30 days or so to wait before um, we expect to get it. So that's coming up real, real soon. Nice. That should be sometime, you know, toward the end of May anyway. We should have our official uh, letter from the IRS, you know, naming us a, a, a charity. Nice. So everything's working. It just takes time but it's working right away i'm real excited about the experiments that's going to be real interesting to see how they come out you know which is the whole point of experiments right experiments define facts that's the point of an experiment and everything up until the experiment's done is theory or conjecture and the experiment is seeing what actually happens in reality you know what does the world how does the world actually act and that's that's what experiments are for so i've got theory but you know i need some facts so that's why we're doing these experiments and as soon as those ex experiments get done even when the very first one gets done i will be you know putting up youtube videos and otherwise i go out through the kickstarter chain as well and we'll be informing people of what the outcome is and it doesn't matter whether that outcome is, is what I hope for, what I don't hope for. That's not the point. Facts are facts, right? Mm -hmm. it's just want facts. Until you have facts, you can't really continue to work the problem. You get to a point where you just need some facts before you go on. So whatever the outcome is, we will publicize it. We will have video cameras there looking at it, doing documentary. So it will all be documented blow by blow as it happens in the lab and uh, discussions of the results and however it comes out that will go up on youtube and everybody can see exactly how it comes out so that's what's coming so hopefully sometime this summer will be the first we get that first simple one done then sometime this summer that will be out exactly how that uh, how that comes out so cool. so it's it's getting close to actually producing a result but we have been working on it constantly, you know, since last uh, July, trying to uh, get it done. It's just not been a simple thing to do to find the right people who are, you know, who aren't too busy doing something else and who don't mind working on something that has to do with consciousness, because that's been a problem as well. Consciousness mm -hmm. is subjective. Science is objective. So science doesn't like working on things that aren't objective. So it's, that's, that's the problem. Scientists don't want to work on things that have to do with consciousness. They say, not our field, not our area. We're not interested because it, it, it's not a necessarily a positive for their reputation to be working on things that they consider not science. It's subjective. So subjective goes to the soft sciences like 
um, you know, uh, anthropology and sociology and psychology and all of those they call soft sciences because they are also working in a subjective field. But the hard sciences like physics and biology and chemistry don't really consider that science. You know, that's not hard science. Well, it is. You know, I'd say it is, but the, the physics and biology and chemistry guys are not so sure that uh, they want to go there in that subjective world. So that's why they call it hard science and soft science. And the soft science people are sure they're doing science, but the hard science people <laughs> aren't so sure. You know, it's one of those uh, bias, uh, you know, belief things that uh, is going on there. So the hard scientists are a little... Uh, I don't know, a little stubborn about that, about that issue, but that's just the way it is. So let's go on. Okay. So we talked about virtual realities last time and I got some interesting questions in. And one of the areas that I wanted to talk about today was kind of continuing on it because obviously this is still part of the virtual reality. If we're going to discuss past lives, because I mean, we've, we've, entertained the concept before when we were looking at tools and things to assist us but this is kind of in looking at it from a virtual reality perspective i mean we come to this if if the larger consciousness system is here to assist us therefore you know can our past lives we've talked about it it is a bit of a distraction because we can get caught up we can do research we can you know start looking through all the things from the past um and that doesn't necessarily help us focus on where we are right now and how that can assist us to grow up some people think that so i'm going to just throw out a bunch of things and then you're going to share what your <laughs> concepts are <laughs> okay. some people think that you know once we've evolved to a certain point then we will begin to remember all our lives but we could have thousands and thousands of lives so it could get very confusing and some of them in a point of time where there was a lot more fear and a lot more darkness that not necessarily would it help us so we're here we're evolving we're like we go through different lives so that we can continue to grow and we continue to move forward in, well, hopefully towards love. Um, so we're evolving versus de-evolving. Um, so we have these past lives. Sometimes, you know, people, places, situations can occur that may trigger a memory or may trigger a feeling that we may associate with past life. So there's that part of that, that, you know, do our past lives somehow assist us in this world is that why we're not is that why we don't remember them because they're just a distraction right now because of where we are um some people had some thoughts about you know is there a maximum because we talked about in our last show about you know right now at this point this is a perfect virtual reality for us to grow um until we need to bring in other you know worlds or other aliens or whatever um we don't need to do that yet but then the question was well you know how many is too many is is there you know is the 7.5 billion that we have right now is that all that we will have or you know what's happening with those people are they just continuously anyway so there's a whole bunch of questions with regards to <laughs> wow. past lives and what they do for us and how they can assist us and so that's why we brought it up brought it up for today <laughs> okay well that was about a dozen questions yep. <laughs> there I, if i can't hit some of them but if i forget any you bring me back to them bring that. Yeah. okay so let's start kind of where you started and that is let's look at what are past lives from the viewpoint of the virtual reality and why do we have them you know why do they exist um i didn't end up with with past lives or what i call uh, experience packets um, because I thought that was a nifty idea or because Eastern, you know, Eastern uh, philosophy and theology has them and I wanted to have them too, you know, it wasn't that <laughs> it was, it was that it's for the virtual reality to work, right. you know, you have to have that. That's just a logically necessary function that has to take place. And it's, it's because learning has to take place seri serially. You don't learn, you can't learn everything at once. 
You know, you learn A, which then enables you to learn B, which then enables you to learn C. And your, your growth is a cumulative function. So, you know, we can't, um, you know, we couldn't just go to school and learn kindergarten through high school, you know, all in, you know, all at the same time. You have to start with the alphabet, you know, and then you learn to count, you know, and then you learn your colors and you have to start with the simple things and keep building and building and building on those simple things. And even when you're in graduate school, you still have to know your alphabet and how to cut, count and what the colors are. It's not that, you know, those things go away. It's that they just build on other things. And the more you understand, then the more you're able to understand as you build your knowledge up. Well, all learning is that way. It's all, it has to be cumulative. It has, it has to aggregate over time and build. Well, we are here in the schoolhouse. Uh, the point of this virtual reality is, like you say, to grow up, to become loved, to change who we are at the being level. It's not about our intellect. It's not to get more stuff in our intellect. It's to get more understanding down at our being level. That's the idea. Well, that's not such an easy thing to do just to change yourself, to be somebody else, you know, somebody else who is less fearful. Mm -hmm. That is a hard thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's not a matter of learning something. You know, you can't read it in a book and then change yourself. You have to actually be somebody else. And they, that generally takes some time because you start out kind of practicing being somebody else before you actually become that somebody else. And it's a slow process. So in order for us to succeed at this evolutionary process through our learning, we have to have more than just one experience. Otherwise, it would never work. The whole concept of the virtual reality as the learning lab where we grow up would just stop because you can't do that all in one shot. You know, we're, we're doing graduate level, uh, you know, life-changing stuff here and and to expect that in one experience packet or one lifetime it's just not going to happen it uh, is way too much to to do though a lot of progress can be made in one lifetime but that's usually a lifetime that's been around maybe ten thousand times <laughs> and then maybe they can make more progress you know in the next lifetime because they have accumulated all that background stuff that they've needed to accumulate so though you might see somebody um, make a lot of progress, that's not their first time around. The only reason they're making all that progress is because all the experiences they've had before that, they're building on those. And sometimes it just all begins to click and fall together. And then you can make a lot of progress, but not on your first trip, you know, thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of experiences before it begins to all fall together. So that's why we have this multiple experience packet or reincarnation is because it's necessary for the virtual reality to work. So it's just a logical consequence of the, of the idea that we live in a virtual reality and that this virtual reality is, is created by consciousness for us individual units of consciousness to evolve in. So given that as the fundamentals, then, the fact that there's reincarnation and you have you need many lifetimes is just logically necessary. So that's where it comes from. Now, the reason when we come here that we don't have memory of all of those is because it just wouldn't be helpful to us. Right. You see, that memory is our intellectual component. Ah. All the things that we can remember, we remember in our intellect. Our intellect goes back and pulls up memories. Okay, so that's our intellectual self. And we're here to grow up at the being level. In other words, change who we are, not at the intellectual level, which would be maybe change who we think we are or change the image we have of ourselves or all that's done at the intellectual level. But actually who we are is defined at the being level. And those are two different things. You know, most people, if you ask them, well, just who are you really? You know, if you're authentic, if you're just you, who would that be? Most people have no idea. They wouldn't know because they, their whole life have been trying to 
be the way people have told them they need to be. They're trying to be polite. They're trying to do the things that they have been told are the right things to do. You know, you go to school, you make good grades, you know, you go to college and you get a good job and you have two and a half children and you learn, you live in the suburbs, you know, these are all the kinds of things that we learn that is the, the right path to go on. So people are out there chugging away on those things, not necessarily because that is who they really are, but just because that's who they're trying to be. You know, that's their image of a successful person. You know, you want a good job, make a lot of money because that's a successful person. And people have that, you know, want to do that. But what does that have to do with being authentic, with really being who you are? Well, they're two very different things. So most of us live because of the way people expect us to live and the way they expect us to be, and because of the way we expect ourselves to be, our own, our own image of ourselves. <clears throat> so we have that. And we learn ways of getting along. You know, we learn all the rules of etiquette and being polite and so on. But does that really represent us? Well, not often. You know, we, we smile when we're really annoyed and we, and we pretend to be, you know, kind of happy. And, you know, people say, well, how's it going? And you go, okay. They don't really want to know how it's going and you're not really telling them anything. You know, these are just polite things that people do to each other, but it's not real. It's just keeping social connections lubricated at a superficial level. So we tend to go through lives like that. And to put more things in your intellect to say, well, okay, if I had all my past lives in my intellect, you know, well, I could think about each one of them. Well, there's a couple of problems with that. But the biggest problem is having these things in your intellect isn't particularly helpful. It's not in your intellect is where the action is. The question would be, if you had these things in your intellect, how would that make you change who you are? How would that help you grow up? Well, it would help you get some intellectual ideas. You might look back and say, oh, okay, now I'm looking at the last three incarnations and boy, I was really uh, angry all the time. I was upset. I was mad with everybody. You know, I just had, I was really self-centered and arrogant. And, uh, you know, and that caused me problems. I can see my past lives. So that caused, well, that might be useful, but you get to do that anyway. Before you actually incarnate to the next life. You get to look back through those past lives, consider all that sort of thing, and then focus on what it is you want to learn this time. So you've already done that, you see, and you set up situations here that will help you be differently. It'll give you challenges to, to grow. So that's already being done. You don't, you know, doing it again with your intellect is just kind of going over what's already been done. It's second, I don't know, you know, second, uh, second guessing a problem, like you figure out an answer and then you go back and look and see whether or not you figured it out right or not. <laughs> well, you can just confuse yourself that way. You know, you, you were uh, actually in a better state then to make those assessments than you would be now where you are not such an authentic person. Before, when you made that assessment, you were more of an authentic person because you were in a space where you didn't have anybody expecting you to be anyway, other than what you were. So you, you make that assessment as an authentic being, and now here we are wrapped up in our image and you know, our politeness and our society and our expectations. And now going over that in your intellect with all those you know, with all that ego and beliefs and expectations in your head along, you know, in your intellect too, eh, that's just not such a good idea either. So it's like, well, what's the point then? Well, you know, sometimes uh, people, uh, I'm trying to think, um, uh, Dr. Um, who does past life regression therapy, he kind of almost defined that, uh, uh, yeah. Brian Weiss. Okay. Right, Dr. Brian Weiss. Okay, he almost defined that that genre. You know, he's a psychiatrist and he uses past lives to to help patients who have issues that are attached to past lives. So he does past life regression, and they go, "Oh, I see. You know, I got I got bitten by a giant spider. You know, last lifetime. That's why I have this phobia about spiders now. All right, well, I can let that go because 
I just, I know what it is now, you know, otherwise I was just driven and I didn't know what was driving me. I just knew I was afraid of spiders, but had no idea why. And now that I know why it's easier to deal with, All right? Well, that's just a phobia. It could be something else. You know, I feel abandoned mm -hmm. and I feel terribly abandoned because yes, in my last lifetime, you know, I got dropped off at the doorstep and you know, I was abandoned and then picked up for a while, then abandoned again. And, you know, I had all this abandonment stuff in my last lifetime. That's why I feel so abandoned. Well, the point is that therapy is good therapy. In other words, what Brian Weiss does works and it helps a lot of people. But that's not necessarily because that's what happened in their last lifetime. You see, that doesn't matter whether it actually happened or not in their last lifetime isn't really the point. The point is, does it help them get over it? You see, he's a therapist. He's helping people get over things. So you can do a past life regression. People will tend to fill in those things that concern them, those things that are very important to them. Those things that drive them will be things that will show up. They show up in your dreams. You know, they, they show up when you're, you know, under hypnosis, being regressed. Those kinds of things that are real core to you tend to pop up when you let them. When you kind of let go and see what's there, that stuff tends to pop up. Well, if somebody is feeling like they have a, some sort of emotional issue or a phobia or abandonment or some other kind of thing, and they, it bothers them enough that they're going to a therapist to try to, you know, to get over it, then sometimes it's very helpful if the therapist can just give them a hook to hang it on, to give them a, a reason why. Oh, it doesn't have anything to do with you. You see, it was three lifetimes ago, such and such happened and such and such happened. And when, you know, the Roman soldiers left and you were, you know, you know staked out to the ground on an anthill, you know, and got saved by wild dogs. And, you know, they'll give you, you'll get some kind of story there. And now you can tend to let it go because you, you kind of understand it, quote unquote, in your intellect. So your intellect comes in and says, oh, okay, I don't need to have that affecting my choices now. You know, it's ruining my life here. It's giving me trouble. And it happened a long time ago. So you, it's much easier then to make peace with it than it is if you're in this mindset, oh, I'm defective. There's just something wrong with me. I have this, you know, this anxiety, and I don't really know why I have this anxiety. I just have it. And when these things happen, I get triggered and have all these problems that's ruining my life. And you think that it's your fault, your problem, and you're defective. You're inadequate. You're this, you're in that. You know, so you're insecure about it. Well, if it's what happened to you three lifetimes ago, Oh, well, that suddenly relieves you from all that responsibility of being inadequate and feeling bad about yourself. You can now go on with your life better. So you see, it's good therapy. Now, that doesn't mean that when Brian Weiss takes his patients there, that what he finds out is not true or is true. The point is, it doesn't matter whether it is or not. You see, it's irrelevant. It works the same way. And sometimes, indeed, it might be a past life because we have we can access those memories with our intent. Right. It's not so much that they're in our brain and we access them in our unconscious. It's not the way it is at all. That's just a kind of a Freudian model that doesn't really work that way. We're getting them out of the database that goes along with this virtual reality. There's a database. It's a historical database. It has all that information in it. And if you open yourself up and from the being level, put out a query to that database, you'll get this information. So when you're under hypnosis, you know, by Dr. Weiss, and he gives you the suggestion to pull this up, well, you're open and you have the intent to get it. Well, there it is. You get it out of that database. So it's not really in your memory to begin with. You're just pulling it out of the database. And in that way, these past lives can serve you well. If you're a patient of Weiss or a patient of the other by now 500 people or a thousand people who do past life regressions, he's, he's been training, you know, like a thousand people a year, you know, to go out and do this. So if you go through that, it's a very effective therapeutic process. And you just have to realize that it doesn't matter 
you are connecting with information, you see, about your, your life or about you. Now, whether that's actually your past life or whether that's just you filling in things about you that are meaningful to you, just like you do in your dreams, you know, you'll have a dream and you'll have the same kind of problem. You'll be inadequate, but it won't be the same kind of inadequacies you do here. You'll, you know, you'll be moving and the new people are going to show up to move in and your house is still full and no, you haven't even started to pack yet, you know, and you'll have these kinds of dreams of failure and inadequacy because that's what you feel deep inside. Mm -hmm. So you'll put them in all different kinds of structures and ways that, that seem very fantasiful, but it's that same old stuff that's you, that's, that is you at the authentic level. You know, the authentic you is inadequate, feels inadequate. I shouldn't say is inadequate, probably is not inadequate, but feels inadequate. You see, that, that's the fundamental, what's there, and that's because of fear. You have a fear of not being adequate. So as long as you have that fear, then you're gonna express these things. And when you do past lives, you'll have a tendency to dress them up in terms of what's meaningful to you inside your own being. So that makes them very good therapy. So are there such things as past lives? Are they real? Yes, there are things as past lives. We have many lifetimes and they're all in the database and they're all accessible to us. We can learn to do that. Uh, you know, ourselves, or we can get a therapist to help us do that, you know, with hypnosis. Uh, there's lots of different ways to approach that process of getting that information. But in general, they're not all that useful as far as growing up. They're often entertaining. Uh, they, they sometimes will feed our egos or not, or maybe surprising or, you know, so there's, it's not that they have, uh, you know, no redeeming value and should be left alone at all costs. It, you can play with that database. That's okay. Uh, but you're not going to learn much there that's really going to help you be better, that helps you get rid of fear. Other than the, other than the way we just talked about it, you'll find something there. And if you can point to that as the problem rather than pointing to yourself, then that'll make you feel better about yourself, which makes you more able to get rid of the fear, you see. So in that sense, that's, that's good. But you don't really need a past life to do that. You could just do that anyway. But past life might be a good metaphor or a good thing to help you, to help you do that. Okay, so that's kind of what are the past lives. Yes, they're real. You do have many lifetimes. The point of those lifetimes is that each lifetime we make choices. And by the choices we make, we evolve or de-evolve our consciousness, the quality of our consciousness. We grow up and we grow, we grow up by getting rid of fear. When we get rid of all the fear, what's left is love. And you know, that's us grown up. So we're on that path. And every one of these life packets or reincarnations, we make choices. And those choices or, you know, just like I said, you have to first learn the alphabet and then the colors, you know, and then a little, and then a few words and you do that. Well, all of those choices are like that. That's all this background stuff, the choices that we've made that help us look at the whole pile of it. Let's say we've had 10,000 past experience packets, 10,000 reincarnations. We can look at all 10,000 of those as a, as a collection and look at that whole thing and say, well, what are the trends here? You know, what are the, what are the things that are really holding me back as far as getting rid of the fear? What are the fears that I've been carrying around with me, trying to get rid of? So you can look at that and you can get some perspective on where you are and where you need to go. And that's what you do before you start the next incarnation, before you start the next experience packet. You do that. You look at that. Your, your individuated unit of consciousness is the thing that collects all those. That's the cumulative function in consciousness. And that IUOC, individual unit of consciousness, is the collector. Okay, so the IUOC just partitions off a part of itself with no intellectual part, just the quality part. And that's what then plays you know, us as, as uh, characters. We're, you know, our bodies are the avatar and this partition part is the, is the consciousness, makes all the choices. And then when that person dies, that partition goes away, and all of that data of all those choices 
is back again with the individual unit of consciousness. And now that's number 10,001. And that's looked along with all the rest. You know, you look at the whole thing and say, okay, what does that tell us? What do we need to do? And sometimes it's, uh, well, we just need to get back in the game and keep trying. You know, that's the, that may be what you need to do. Or there may be some special thing that's been bothering that you really want to focus on getting rid of. And you can do that too after a bit. So that's kind of the, the incarnation thing and why we have it and what it's there for. Um, it can be used as good therapy. It uh, doesn't really matter. You know, it's like the, you know, it's like those uh, ink blot tests. Remember that was a, that was a Freudian tool back in the forties or fifties where you'd look at these little splotches of black on white. And then the, the therapist would say, what do you see? You know, what do you see in those pictures? And of course, all that stuff that was in you at the being level would help form what you saw. Because if you were, you know, if you had certain kinds of fears, then you tend to interpret those things certain ways because the ink blots were very nonspecific and could be interpreted many, many ways. And depending on what was in your being level, who you were authentically, then you would interpret them differently. And they had a whole set of interpretations. And if you interpret them this way, it means that. And what they were doing was trying to measure who you were at the, you know, at the authentic being level. Who is this patient of mine? What are their real issues down deep? Not what do they tell me about out of their intellect, because that's just so much yama, yama, yama. But what, who are they really deep down? So they give tests like that to find out who was that authentic person inside that patient and what really was their problem. So it's, you see, these same sort of things have been, have been going on and being used for a long time. So ink blot texts or, or uh, you know, past life regression are all just tools that people can use to get you to express the authentic you in a situation so that you can deal with it in a, in a, in a way that you're kind of outside of it. Yeah, it's not really you, you know, you kind of step outside of it. And now you're looking back at it objectively. Oh yeah, that was my third lifetime ago, or that was my last lifetime. Well, now it's you looking back at it objectively rather than you, the one with the problem who are defective, who just have this, you know, have this issue. You say, then you can't get over it that in that space it's really hard to let it go whereas if you can back away from it and look at it objectively then it's much easier for you to let it go and basically that's what that's what you pay a psychiatrist to do to take your problems and pull them out in an objective place so that you can see them because mm -hmm. otherwise they're just buried inside of you and you just suffer them but you can't really see them because you don't have the objective viewpoint so that's what we pay shrinks to do for us anyway, you see. And here you can do that same thing with, with other tools, with ink blots and with, uh, you know, with past life regression and other such things are just tools to help you accomplish that. And once you can get away from it and look at it objectively, it's so much easier to do something about it. Because Okay, so we have these past lives and... Sometimes we have, I don't know, sometimes we're, we're somewhere that we've never been before and yet it seems familiar. Sometimes it's, you know, we connect with a person and, you know, it just appears that there's more to it than, you know, like all of a sudden there's a feeling that maybe never was there before. You don't understand why it's there all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So was that part of past life. And then there's this part where... <laughs> And I know that it's the, the karma aspect, um, but, you know, people think, you know, they'll go into a past life or they may think that, or they may have, you know, connected in. And I know it doesn't matter whether it was our life or it's just part of the data that we're connecting in with, but, you know, they'll connect in with someone and they'll think that their life was great or whatever. And then they're thinking, well, what did I do in this past life? Or what did I do to get to where I am now? Because clearly I'm not happy with who I am now. And so then there's like this, you know, what terrible thing did I do to be where I am right now? And I think it's, I mean, these are all the kind of questions that a lot of people have, but it, at the same time, they're, you know, I think we put too much emphasis and that's why I 
find that, you know, often when we do certain things like this, it can be a distraction. But at the same time, you know, we know that there's some sort of connection. We can feel a connection with someone or place or situation where we're going, well, I've never had this before in this life. So we know that there's something, whether we're connecting in with a past life or connecting in with the data, but there's something. And then, yeah, so there's those two kind of. Okay, well, let's get those two things. Uh, Yes, we do connect to that data. Like I say, if, if your mind is open and you're just asking, you know, you you just have that thought and it may just buzz through your mind just because you have all sorts of thoughts buzzing through your mind all the time. And if that thought comes back, uh, you know, let's say you're at some, some uh, old place. Let's say you're at some ancient ruin or something. And you might just think about, wow, I wonder what it was like to live here. Well, just that thought, just because you're interested, well, go get data from the database, and there you are. You know, one of those little munchkins, you know, with your, you know, bearskin, uh, you know, <laughs> pants on, and you're, you know, you're digging holes in the dirt looking for food or something, and you can experience that. You can go because you had the thought, you had the question. Gee, I wonder what it was like living here, you know, 5,000 years ago, and you, you get glimpses of it, and you can see it, and you can feel it. And if you allow yourself to actually indulge in that, you can get a lot out of it. Most people go, oh, well, it's just my imagination. And then they, you know, shake it off and go on. But you can get that sort of thing. And if you, you know, come by a, a building or something and you look at it and say, wow, this is really familiar. And your mind then says, what could that be familiar with? Well, you've asked the question. That's a query to the database. So out goes and you, you know, you get some data back of why that seems to be familiar with you. And, oh, okay, I used to live in a house like that. But no, I didn't. Not in this lifetime. I didn't ever live in a house like that. But now I really remember living in a house like that. So, yes, those things are really queries to the database. So you can query the database, and most people do, all the time without knowing that they're querying the database. A query is just created by your intent. And if you have an intent and your intellect is not the one that's making the intent, okay, you feel this, this intent is something that is deeper than that. It's not just curiosity because if it's just curiosity in your intellect, gee, I wonder what these people, you know, were like 10,000 years ago. Well, nothing much happens. It's just it. You know, it's, there's nothing there. But if you're calm enough in yourself and you're just thinking, wow, I wonder what it really was like being there, you know, then, well, that's not just your intellect. That's a deeper level feeling that's coming out of your being level. And that will make the connection. And that will bring up all of this information coming. And then when it comes, then we often immediately jump out of that back into our intellect. And then we get just little snippets of things, you know, in a museum or something else. And we get all these little snippets because once we connect at the being level, and if we don't really know what we're doing, Typically, as soon as we start getting data, we jump out into the intellectual level and start uh, assessing the data and are surprised that we got that information, which, of course, stops the whole thing from happening. It doesn't happen anymore. So if you can just stay in it, you can get a whole lot more information in a lot of detail, emotional information, not just facts, but feelings and other things. But most of us, uh, if we do it by accident, we pop right back out of it into our intellect as soon as it starts. But those things happen to everybody. Besides that, we humans and animals too, everything that's conscious is connected to everything else that's conscious. So we're constantly trading data. So you and I are sitting here looking at uh, pictures of each other on a, on a monitor, you see, but at the same time, we're communicating in a, in a nonverbal, non-body language, consciousness to consciousness at the same time. It's all part of how we communicate. It, uh, you know, we, we uh, kind of get to read between the lines when we do that. We not only get the lines, but we get between the lines. We understand what people mean, even when they don't say it. We understand, you know, where they're coming from, even when they don't tell us. That's because we're communicating consciousness to consciousness Continually. That's just a, a third link besides language and body language. There's telepathy that's going on as well. And again, as soon as your intellect gets hold of it, then you pop right out of it. 
Now you're just analyzing the stuff you got. But as long as you're getting it from the being level, then it just continues to flow. So that's why people who learn to live at the being level and to focus at the being level, and they can learn how to do that. Well, these are the people who are your mediums. You know, they're your mystics. They're the people who can help you find your past lives. They do that just because they've learned how to stay at that being level and work as opposed to constantly popping back up into the intellectual level. And they take years to learn how to do that. You know, it's not a trivial thing that you just, you know, learn because you want to. It's something you have to practice at. So that's, you know, when, when you were uh, at Lumley, you know, I spent more time harping on that probably than anything else. You know, you gotta get into that being level and stay there and be able to work there without getting your intellect in because that just takes you right out. So these things just happen automatically. We don't have to think about, oh, I want to telecommunicate, you know, or I want to get data out of the database. Our thoughts just, if they come out of our being level, they just make a connection and we get the data. And people who don't ever get into their being level, who only live in their intellects, don't have those experiences very often. Those are very rare experiences. So you take your, your typical right brain person and they have experiences like that all the time. Almost every hour of every day, they have experiences like that. that. That's their life. That's how they live, connected in that way to information. And they don't know where the information comes from. They just know it's available. When they get in the right kind of mood and they think the right kind of way, stuff happens. You see, it's just they know that. And the people who live out of their heads, who are very left brain, they hardly ever have that. Matter of fact, they would deny that, they, that intuition even exists because whenever they've had hunches, they generally don't work out. And that's because their hunches are really coming out of their intellect, not out of their being level. So they're not really connected to their intuitive side. They work out of their head and they don't get deja vu and they don't you know, think about past lives. Now we'll go on to that last thing you said, and that is the people who do just the opposite of therapy. You know, if opposite of therapy means you do things to make yourself ill. Well, those are the ones that say, oh, well, look at my life now. It's so terrible. What have I done? You see, what they're doing is taking an issue and making it personal. What have I done? How have I failed? What am I doing that, you know, because that just adds to their feeling of insecurity and inadequacy and all the other negative things that people feel. You know, they just add to it by saying, oh, I must have screwed up. I must really, have, you know, deserve this kind of awful stuff but because I must have done some really bad things. And so they, they blaming this all in their selves, right? And when you blame it on yourself, that's just the opposite of therapy. Remember, we talked about the therapy is to take it and not blame yourself, but to see that it's past life. It's something else. It's not me. It was, you know, my last life. And by getting it outside of you where you see it objectively, you can heal it more easily. Well, you can do just the opposite of therapy, which is make yourself ill. And you make yourself ill by taking things that are just parts of your consciousness and personalizing them to your own failure. Mm. Now you see it as part of your own failure, your own inability, and you're not happy. And of course, you're not going to be happy because you interpret things. Everything that isn't the way you want it is somehow your failure. Mm. And when you're a failure, then it just... See, that's just a spiral that goes down and down and down until you're depressed. <laughs> and the only, the only feelings you have left are being unhappy feelings. Mm -hmm. So it's the opposite of therapy. It's how can I make myself thick, sick? Well, I can blame everything on me. I can take everything personal. And even if I get angry at other people, doesn't mean that you don't blame it on you. Because you see, when some people, when, if let's say you feel inadequate and somebody says something, that makes you feel inadequate. Well, your reaction to that is to get angry with them, holler at them, put them down, uh, you know, get, get, get mad, get angry. But basically what's happened is that they've triggered your own feeling of being unworthy in yourself. And you're really upset with yourself for being so unworthy. The anger you have at somebody else and blaming them is just your strategy for not facing your fear. Oh, it's not me. 
George is just such a jerk. You know, he just always does this stuff. He's not nice. He's not thoughtful, you know, and it's just not fair. And, you know, that sort of thing. And those, that's your strategy to not say, you know, to not own it basically and say, this is my fear. That's why I react that way. Oh no, it's not my fear. It's George being such a jerk. <laughs> that's why it's that way. You know, it's because of other people. So you blame all the stuff on other people. And then you think, why me? I'm a nice person. Why do I have to suffer? You see, but as soon as somebody mentions something that triggers your fear, you turn around and get angry, bl blame somebody else, but feel bad about yourself. You're feeling bad about you, which is why you get angry. So you don't have to admit to yourself that you're feeling bad about you. You see, it's just, you know, the way we are. And people get trapped in that and make themselves ill and everything is about them. So even if George was really just talking about a fact he read in the newspaper, you're liable to interpret it as something personal to you. You know, and he has no idea that he just said something that pushed your button, but he doesn't. You get angry and he has not a clue, you know, what's going on. But that's because you interpret everything to be your problem. But rather than see it as your problem, you got to blame somebody else for it. So that's that's where most people make themselves miserable. See, that's the thing. If you if you get rid of the fear, you're not miserable. All your buttons go away and now you find joy and happiness and you like people and people like you and your relationships are great because you don't have that response of getting upset because somebody's triggered one of your fears and then getting angry with them because of it. You see, when, once all that's gone out of your life, then suddenly you think, gosh, everybody suddenly got so nice. These people used to be so mean, you know, and now they're much nicer. Well, the only thing that happened is that you got less fearful and it makes everybody else seem like they're nicer. That's, I remember reading a, a lady who, what was she, what did she do? She took Prozac and she was writing a kind of a tongue in cheek uh, article. And she says, it's amazing. If you take pro, if you take Prozac, it makes everybody else in your life get nicer. <laughs> and that was her, that was her viewpoint. Well, if it keeps you from having that depressed attitude where you're angry and upset then it seems like everybody else has suddenly gotten nicer but that's not the case everybody else is the same it's that you have gotten less sensitive to your fear you've gotten you know some some handle on your on your fear but so that's it with with past lives they're they're there they're real real we do have past lives you can get that data out of a database you can get it out of the database without even trying right. If you try, it's easy enough if you can stay in a good meditation state without thoughts coming in and without your intellect jumping in, which takes some practice. <laughs> but if you can't, if you don't do that practice, you still will get them and they'll just come and go as your idle thoughts tend to come and go at the being level. But if it's an intellectual thought, not so much. If it's a being level thought, in other words, when you say, I wonder how those people lived 10,000 years ago, if that's just a curiosity in your mind, well, nothing will happen, all intellectual. But if that's really a heartfelt, you really would like to know. You'd really like to, you know, have some feeling or, or notion of, of what it was like to be there. And it's not just an intellectual thought, but it's something you really would like to feel. That's the being level I'm talking about, and that makes the, that makes the connection. But then don't get frightened and jump back into your intellectual level as soon as you start getting the download of information, you know, ask questions, modify your query, you know, keep, keep working on it. So ultimately, we have all this information at our fingertips. We can use it mm -hmm. as we want or as, you know, as it kind of applies to us but it's not really necessary what we have right now in this life is all that we need to evolve and grow because we know that prior to coming into this we've already gone through a review we've already decided what things we want to work on now um, so it doesn't really matter about the past lives mm -mm. interesting it may be our life it may be <laughs> just the data that we're connecting with mm -hmm. um, it may be you know maybe we 
I don't know, do we even have guides? <laughs> I know that'll be a whole different story, but it could have been that we were, you know, we were observing somebody else's life at a different time because that was what we were, we wanted to do. I, you know, there's so many things. And of course the whole karma thing kind of, well, messes with a lot of people. <laughs> well, think, well, well, let's talk about karma just a little okay. bit. I know our hour's just about up, but uh, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about car karma a little bit. Karma isn't anything more other than the fact that if you don't learn it now, you'll have to learn it later. That's it. But people That's, see it as a punishment, though. They think no, that they've done something it, wrong. Yeah, it's no punishment. It's not <laughs> that. Basically, what they've done is that they haven't learned something. But that's not doing something wrong. It's just a failure to do something right, I guess. You know, they haven't grown. So if you don't learn this, let's say your problem is, is that you feel, uh, I don't know, inadequate again. You know, if that's it. And, you, and that's a fear. The fear is, I am unworthy. That's the fear. Well, if you have that fear, then you're going to make choices based upon that fear. That fear is going to animate almost every choice you make. will have that will be a part of it. And if you don't outgrow it, well, you'll have to get over that fear in the next lifetime. And if you don't outgrow it, then you'll have to get rid of it in the next lifetime. And actually what you do is you may get rid of 5% of it in this lifetime and another 5% the next lifetime. And after 20 lifetimes, you may have gotten rid of it, you see, or maybe it's only 1%, you know, or maybe it's 50% in a lifetime, but you keep working on these things and doing better. That's how you evolve. That's called evolution. If you aren't making any progress, then you're not evolving. You see, and if you're and if you're getting more fears, then you're de-evolving. So that's, you know, that's what we're here for. But karma is nothing more than if you don't figure it out this lifetime, you'll get the f another chance. This is not a time test. You know, take as long as you as you need to to learn these things, but you. Don't progress until you learn them because what you're doing is getting rid of fear and you'll work on that fear until you get rid of it. So you don't have to do it in the same way. You don't have to be treated like you treated somebody. You know, it's not all that sort of thing at all. It's not punishment for doing bad things. All of that people have taken it and kind of made it something more than it is. Yeah. It's just the fact that if you don't learn it, you now you have to learn it later. But the whole point of being here is to learn it. So you get as many chances as you need to say, get rid of that feeling of inadequacy. If that's a fundamental thing you're trying to get rid of it, uh, you can get rid of it in one lifetime or a thousand. And maybe after a thousand, you're still working on it. If you <laughs> haven't really been working too hard on it because you don't know what you're here for, you don't know why this reality exists. You know, you don't know your purpose and you're just kind of wandering around clueless. Then, It'll take a long, long time, which is the way most people are. It's not a quick thing. Once you focus on what you're trying to do, then you can learn so much more quickly, so much faster. So that's kind of the point of us talking about all this stuff is to help people see that they're, you know, what game they're in and what they need to be working on and not to feel bad if they can't get rid of a fear, you know, like next week. <laughs> These are things you're going to work on. You know, this is, you know, this is your work, not only in this lifetime, but in the next lifetime and the next lifetime. Don't be too hard on yourself. Right. You know, the point isn't that if I don't get rid of it, I'm a failure. Right. It's just setting yourself up for failure. The point is that you work on it. You make the best choices you can. You learn from those choices and that's it. And you go on. That's the whole thing. There is no failure. You just make the best choices you can and you learn from what the choices you make. And that is optimizing what's here. It's not if I don't get rid of this, it's a failure. Well, I haven't gotten rid of it in the past, so I must be a failure. You know, That is the opposite of therapy. That's how to make yourself full of fear. That's and it doesn't mean that if if somebody leaves you in this past, in this life, that you actually killed them in the life before. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. I know. The, but that's what it, people think, right? I know. Existence is not that petty. You know? <laughs> that sounds like, you know, people are, are expressing their, their self-centeredness and their pettiness, you know, onto the system. 
the system's not that petty. Oh, you killed somebody now. So that person will have to kill you this time. And, or you did this and that you were, you know, you were a monster and all this stuff. Now you have to deal with monsters the next time. That's not it. That's way too, uh, you know, much detail. If you were a monster, well, yes, you may, part of your learning may be to come and have to deal with monsters so you can see the other side and therefore learn. That's true. That could be that way. But it's not because this happens, then that has to happen. Right. The, the life that you have here, you start it out based on this is something that will hopefully optimize my ability to learn. It gives me the greatest potential for learning. But you have to reach out and grab that opportunity and make something of it. All you're going to get in this life is opportunities to make good choices. You have to make the good choice. It, the choice won't be made for you. So it's, yeah, it just, people find so many ways to convince themselves that they're unworthy and failures. Ah, that's... And all it does is trap themselves in that. And then they can't get out and they, then they blame everybody else. And then they look around and say, why me? I'm so miserable and unhappy. All my relationships fail. You know, I don't have any really good friends. All my friends use me and, da, 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 da. and they see themselves as this pitiful person down at the bottom of the pile. And, you know, they don't get any breaks. They don't have any luck except bad luck. And it's just, uh, you know, they have that negative attitude, which then reinforces all that negative stuff. And then that's proof that I really must not be much of anything because, look, I'm down here at this bottom. If I were really a good person, I'd be soaring. So then it just makes it worse. And it's just the cycle. It feeds itself. And it's really difficult to climb out of that if you're stuck in that sort of negative attitude about yourself. All these buttons are hooked to negative attitudes about yourself. Mm -hmm. All these buttons, everything that, that rings your bell and makes you, you know, sit up and get angry or, you know, makes you upset or makes you feel uncomfortable. All of those things go back to some negative feeling you have about yourself. That's what's being triggered and you need to let go of it. It just, it's not helpful. And it doesn't mean that you're an evil, awful person. It just means that for some reason you believe you are because in, you know, at the fundamentals of reality, you're not an evil, awful person. You're just a person trying to evolve like everybody else. No different than anybody else, whether it's the super guru or whether it's the person under the bridge, you're just like them in that you're trying to make the best choices you can with what you got, with what you bring to the game. And if you just do that and say, well, okay, I'll just make my best choices and let the chips fall where they may and look back, learn from it so I can make better choices. And that's my ticket out of here. <laughs> and that's, that's all you have to do. There's no such thing as failure. You just do the best you can and everything will get better. Well, this has been a great show. <laughs> I've kind of enjoyed this. I have a feeling that there we're going to get some more questions around this. And please uh, forward them to me or put the comments in the YouTube uh, mm -hmm. uh, episode so that we can see them and uh, we'll get to them. But yeah, I kind of like this show. It was kind of fun. It was kind of fun. <laughs> it was. And we're only, we're only nine minutes over. So that's, well, you know. that's pretty good. <laughs> We started a bit late for me. All right. So you have been listening to News for the Heart. We've been getting to the heart of what matters with Tom Campbell. Do check him out. You know, his YouTube station has literally hundreds. Um, his website, mybigtoe.com. You can go to his forum. You can ask questions with him. You can contact me, and I will definitely forward some questions. Um, we like to deal with the practical, so... Some of the stuff is a little too sciencey for me, so he can deal with that <laughs> or some of those other people. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to us connecting next month. And uh, thanks, Tom. You're welcome, Lori. Thank you. Have a question for Lori and want to be on the next news from the heart show? Drop us a line via instant feedback at bmajor.org. News from the Heart is brought to you by Intuitive Soul and is produced by Major Radio for Clear Channel's iHeartRadio and bmajor.org.